Welcome back to the What's Your One More podcast. Today, I am joined by a guest that I'm very excited to have on the show. Uh, he is an author and a current manager of over $750 million in assets. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the show Rocco Carrera. For the last 20 years, he's been advising business owners and entrepreneurs with wealth management. He's also been on news outlets such as Fox News, CNBC, and has recently been published in the Wall Street Journal and Forbes magazine as well. Rocco, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you on here today. Thanks for having me, Quentin. Yeah, so you're you're joining us all the way from from Southampton, New York today, correct? You were mis- just mentioning pre-show. It's sunny and starting to look alive over there. So uh, that's that's fantastic. And uh, you know, down here in Florida, I feel like that's us about nine months out of the year. And uh, it, it, it's uh, it's different when we talk about you know seasonality and things in, in different areas. And you know, when we're talking about real estate and growth and financial growth, you were kind of lending some information to us out the show at the beginning here about the seasonality of business up there as well. And I thought that was super interesting. We'll touch on it here in a little bit, but. Before we get started, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and and why you're currently on so many podcasts right now. I've I've looked this up prior to having you on the show here, and and quite frankly, you're a monster at talking to people right now. It's pretty impressive how much you're out there. Hey, uh, well, sure, I'm happy to tell you uh, tell you all about that. So I'm um, here in Southampton, Long Island, New York. Uh, here, you know, probably one of the hottest spots for. Um, as far as pricing for real estate in the country, the Hamptons are kind of unique to the rest of Long Island. Uh, the Hamptons very much represents a market that overflows from New York City, from Manhattan. Um, we've got, it's just, I can't even believe what some properties sell for it here. I mean, there's properties that are selling for a hundred million, 200 million, 300 million. And, um, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's not, if that doesn't happen all the time, but right. You can't even find a home here any longer for uh, for under a million dollars, but um, but the Hamptons is uh, is a you know very much historically has been the playground for wealthy people from Manhattan, and uh, and that's where we're located. Yeah, you know, when I hear hundred million, I think like, oh, that must be a commercial building. But you're talking about a residential building, so I feel pretty good about the affordability here in Florida. When I preach that all the time to people, I'm like, hey, affordability sounds like we're <laughs> we're in a pretty good position down here, but. Obviously, you know, the uh, the Hamptons come with a title of just, uh, you know, kind of what you expect is exactly what you just said. And, you know, you have some unique clients. You manage three quarters of a billion dollars, you know, and I think that for me, that says you're doing something right. And it says you're doing something that's trustworthy. And it says you're doing something that people believe in. And I think what I've studied in the background here is really your perception on the three chords and why that's made you so successful. You know, you've written a book. And the book's called Three Chords Approach to Life, Wealth Management for Business Owners. And I really like what you have to say in this book about the balancing aspect. And I really kind of wanted to dive right into that. And I think because what you said is I found a recipe for success and why people are connected. And I really kind of felt as I was reading more and learning more about this, you talk a lot about servant leadership uh, without saying servant leadership, because serving others and, and building those relationships are really at the foundation of success. And I love that because I think that's one of the highest compliments someone could get is servant leadership. So tell us a little bit about the three chords, how you discovered it, and how you're applying it to businesses and people all over the country. All right. So um, uh, just to give you kind of a little bit of a background. So I've been in the world of wealth management for uh, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and business owners for about 25 years. And um, the three chords came about after studying the the uh, that particular segment of the marketplace for a long time, and what I discovered was was that um, true wealth was not uh, just the just the money. Super successful business owner um, with tons of financial resources did not equate to somebody really feeling truly wealthy and being a real success. Um, the the business owners that we work with that had great relationships with their loved ones in their lives, their family, and their friends, and also the business owners then had good health, um, believed in per, uh, per, um, personal and professional development, where they were growing as individuals, helping others in their communities. Uh, uh, you know, it was all three. It wasn't just one of the three, and the people that had all three. Uh, they were the they were the strongest uh, to all weather any environment and or anything really quite frankly that was going on in their life mm-hmm. personally or professionally. So I wrote a book on it. Yeah, and you know I think I'm gonna unpack something you said there. A couple things. So you know you said hey, just because the people that made the most money weren't necessarily the happiest or they weren't the most successful and uh, they were missing some things in their lives. 
But who were some of the greatest CEOs that you found, or who maybe a mentor you found that helped you develop this process? Like, who was your greatest study case on this? Um, let's see here. I I work with a lot of uh, a lot of really highly hard charging successful CEOs, and the um, I can give you a couple couple scenarios. Um, uh, so you know, one being you know, uh, I'll give you give me two different scenarios. Okay, one. One uh, one person that uh, continues to try to fi- try to find happiness at, a, at at this particular point in life. Mm-hmm. Person is in there. Um, they're in their mid mid uh, mid seventies now. Okay, uh, married four times. Um, s- struggles with relationships with their with their kids, stepchildren, and um, pretty much relationships with lots of people. Uh, fabulously wealthy and um and so just kind of not happy all the time right? mm-hmm. and so uh, so th- so that was uh and and you know and this had some uh, some medical challenges as well okay so again let's do this if you look at the three courts there self being how are they how are they doing personally as far as their physical health their family and then their business so one of the three which was business and money super successful the other two, not so successful, right? And so I can't. So if you think about the happy, uh, the happy meter, figuring out, okay, you know, how how high are they on the happy meter? It's very low. Uh, it's very low. Then there's uh, another uh, another CEO that we work with that also super successful with their business, uh, very successful financially, mm-hmm. has a great relationship with his uh, with his wife and his children. Um, also takes care of his health, exercises daily, watches what he eats and drinks, um, always reading books, focused on personal development, and also helping others in their community. Yeah. And so the happy meter for him, very high, very, very high, loving life, um, and just a, a kind, kind, generous person. So you, you've got the two spectrums. So you got the spectrum one, mm-hmm. you know, and in fact, their net worths are about equal. Right, so their, their net their net worths are uh, let's see here they're in the um, so that would be the they're in the nine digit area as far as net worth. So when you you're crossing the hundred million mark, um, you would think you know oh you know at that they don't have a problem. Everybody's got yeah never have a problem in the world, but everybody has everybody's has problems. Even people that have uh, nine figures of, of total assets. But, um, and, you know, some, some people argue and say, well, you know, Rocco, I, I hear what you're saying. Money doesn't necessarily buy happiness. Um, it, that is true. But I could tell you that their money has fixed a lot of problems and things, not only for themselves and other people. So right. money is very important, sure. right? Money gives you the opportunity to help a lot of people, including yourself and the ones that are around you. So money is important. But the other two areas are, are equally as important. How yeah. you are as an individual and also your, your relationships with your family, your friends. Yeah, I was always told like money won't buy you happiness, but it sure will solve a hell of a lot of problems. So sounds like uh, exactly what you're describing there. You know, do you feel like there has to be, you talk about these three chords, do they have to be perfectly balanced at all times or is there an imbalance that takes place? That's a great question everybody asked. And so there is no uh, optimum balance. In fact, you can't work on all three, three things at once. I agree. But you have to work on all three. So the only way to do that is through creating something called a model calendar, mm-hmm. right? So uh, you gotta, you really, you gotta be kind of calendar focused. Being calendar focused doesn't sound so spontaneous and kind of boring, mm-hmm. but if you want to achieve success in the three areas, you gotta be calendar focused, right? And and when you say that, you know, are you saying, hey, listen, if you're going to put in a tremendous amount of energy and effort uh, throughout the year on this on this calendar focus, are you saying, hey, you know? half of the year focus on business or a quarter of the year focus on business, the other quarter uh, or half on business, half on family, then year round focus on health as part of your routine and your actions and what you're doing. Like kind of break that down a little bit for us. Uh, Could you repeat that question again? So when you're talking about being that kind of focused, are you talking about like, um, I've always heard like, uh, you know, Pareto's law, the 80-20 rule. And I'm involved in that, I've heard it specifically to business and countering business life is that sometimes you're going to be 80% focused on business and you're going to recognize that you're 20% focused on family. 
But then there's times that you got to be 80% focused on family and 20% focused on business. Is that the balance yeah. that you're referring to? I Yeah, exactly. You know, business people always have business in the back of their mind. And that's just, that's the classic entrepreneur, business owner, CEO. Uh, I don't think any um, highly successful business person brings their business thinking down to zero for a very long period of time. Right. So it is the burrito principle when you think about it. Um, and it is, you know, it's like, okay, shift into family and friends role, you know, role 80%. I'm, I'm, I'm there. And then vice versa uh, with business as well. So you're, you're right. It's, it's not a, not a hundred percent in any one particular area. It's, it's, it's basically as a percentage of energy being uh, placed. When you work with people that are, that are clients of yours and they say, Hey, Rocco, I, I love what you're saying. I just don't have enough time in the day to do these things. How do you how do you answer that to someone that says I don't have enough time in the day? Do you ever get that enough time in the day to make all of this work? Uh, I just had this conversation with um, one of one, a family member, a younger family member, and he's like, you know, he's like, you seem to manage it all pretty well, and you make your decisions. You put your fam, you put your family first. Yep. And so it's values based. So the okay. people that say I just don't have enough time. It's just, they're just not, you know, they're not clear on their values or it's not high up on the value uh, value chart as to what they say they can't put time in with. So a person says, I have no time to go to the gym ever. Well, they obviously don't value their uh, their, their physical health very much. If it mm-hmm. was very high up there, you could bet they'd get to the, the, get to the gym. Or somebody says, I just don't have enough, I just don't have the time to be there for my kids all the time because I have to run this company. Well, yeah. you know, it's obviously not on the top of the list as far as important, you know, yeah. important value. Agree. Same thing with business. So agreeing and, and agreeing. So, conversations like that always escape me because um, I don't know how, like, I always call it a priority issue. And in, from a value, I call it a priority issue. And um, I love the analogy that I had a dear friend share with me that said, you know, Rocco, God willing, this doesn't happen, this scenario, but you're sitting here today, your phone pops up and it's someone from a local hospital that a family member has been taken to the hospital from a car accident. Your your value, your priority right now is off of this and you're not texting someone, letting them know you're going. You're not stopping by Starbucks. You're not drafting an email. You're there because it was a priority right then and there. But it took it that level to get to a priority. If people treated uh, these values, as you described, like a priority of that manner, they would find time in the day to get these things done and they wouldn't worry about everything else around it. Uh, that I, I think most people haven't really defined their values and written them down, right? Everybody's, mm-hmm. yeah, I know what my values are, but if you have five values, so you could you can Google a list of all the values that are out there. It gives you it'll give you eighty words. Okay, so, you know, go through the exercise of narrowing down what are my top five, and that when you find out what somebody's top five values are, you know how they make their decisions in life. Uh, that's a good way of looking at it. So your values decide. Excuse me, your values determine your decision making. There's clients that we work with that, uh, without question, they are the they are the picture perfect of health. They're at the gym every day. They have. They are super successful within their business, but have really bad relationships with their uh, family, friends, people. But if you looked at them, you're like, oh, they got it all together. They're right. so physically fit. They're fabulously wealthy. They're missing that one chord. And they're quite honestly, not the happiest people that you've ever met in your life. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. And I mean, you see a lot of that through social media, just in general about this. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You see that through social media. That's a real eye-opening experience. I think when the limited time I have to get on there to do stuff for the show, you definitely see that. What do you say to people that think they can create more hours in the day to satisfy these three chords by deterring the amount of sleep they get? I've always found this notion interesting. And I wonder if you have CEOs or if you have clients that are doing this currently to help satisfy all three chords you know that isn't healthy either you know the people that that burn out the you know they're up at 2 30 in the morning three o'clock in the morning but you know everybody can do that for a little while but mm-hmm. it's not not sustainable over the long term something's going to break uh in that particular case it's just you know people that are making money the question you have to ask yourself how much is enough okay right that that's um uh, because you know we you know we 
that's you know as CEOs, entrepreneurs, and business owners, you can work twenty four seven. You can keep making more and more money, but at a certain point, it's it's not. It's really you know it's it doesn't it doesn't really it doesn't really move the needle anymore for you. Um, and so that's the uh, so so again that you know so it's 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 the it's the balance and it's like it's kind of figuring out what you really want for yourself like what kind of relationships do you want to have with your kids and your spouse what kind of relationships do you want to have with your uh you know your employment team uh how do you want to yeah you know you want to take care of yourself all that stuff yeah all critical aspects you know i think that uh michael hyatt i heard him speak one year at a, a leader cast um summit and he said you know there's a definition of great ceos and leaders they're all around you um, and the, and then there's certain ones and he name dropped. I won't do that here on the podcast, but he poked at particular ones, some that are very prominent in the news right now, if you may. And he said, these individuals that pride themselves on this four hours of sleep each night or two hours or three hours of sleep, he's like, that is actually going to catch up to them very quickly. And he said, uh, you know, he said there was a study done by John Hopkins and Stanford both that said less than six hours of sleep, constant good sleep per night over one week, you are operating cognitively of that of a legally drunk person so you're behind the steering wheel of your career legally drunk essentially at that point you know americans we like to flex our muscles and <laughs> say, i get up at 4 15 in the morning and i work until 11 o'clock at night and anybody can do that uh but it, you will you burn out over time so i i think that um i think it's kind of figuring out you know figuring out what what you what your body needs and what you need because if if you screw up the first quarter being yourself mm -hmm. and you end up sick, you're not going to be able to help your business and you're not going to be able to help your family. Yeah. And so I mean, you got to take care of yourself so you can take care of your business and take care of your family. Yeah. We know that better now than ever coming out of the COVID realm that we've been in right now, that self-care is just critically important more so. And I think it's been brought to the forefront more so now than ever before. So uh, I love that that if you had to put these in order, is that the first one in order self care when you're putting these cords? There one that weighs heavier than the others, or all three balanced? Um, I would say you know the I would say you know most most of your audience and business owners and CEOs and entrepreneurs they don't put themselves first, okay? Right? They they put their they put them they put their family first, they put their business second, and they put themselves third, and. Um, including myself that's 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 the that's the order that i put it for myself and i wrote the book on it right <laughs> and so um and if i didn't if i don't pay attention to myself i would not necessarily go for my scheduled doctor's appointments i would not exercise i would not watch what i'm eating or drinking but uh i find that to be the hardest of the court for yeah. day i would agree. um and but some people that they do that that's what they do best right that's what they do best so Listen, there's, there's no right or wrong way to do it as long as you're as long as you're putting time and energy to all three. Uh, that's really the you know that that's the critical that's the critical key component. Yeah, I love that, and I, I've always told people whether and you know I'm hiring them for a future job or just talking in general to people about our industry in particular that that family life is a base. It's a foundation to your success. If you're looking at a triangle, it's the base. And if things aren't right at home, they're not going to be right at work. Uh, it's just real simple because that home life gets messed up and you don't have the support. Like I look at where I am in my life. I'm nowhere without my significant, you know, uh, family, wife, children support that I get from them. Without that, none of none of anything I've ever done in my career makes sense. And so I've always tried to relay that to people that that home life has to be super strong and you have to have a tremendous amount of mutual support for one another. It just can't be one way. That's the second, you know. So managing managing that is 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 harder than business. Business is the easiest of the three, right? <laughs> you know, to, to it really, you know, agree. You get to pick your customers. If you have a, if you're successful in business, you pick your customers. You pick your your team members that are working for you. That you know, family. You don't necessarily get to pick and choose, and it's there's different dynamics. You can't you can't fire your son or your daughter. And so it's like. You gotta so it's it's very very different and it's definitely the hardest um you know the hardest but i gotta tell you it's probably it's the most rewarding and the most important over time agreed uh what you know and i don't think anybody can argue that uh and the people that don't have that um you know they'll, they'll tell you that they kind of they kind of regret that or they really miss that in their life yeah i i i, I completely understand do you find there's a paradigm between those that grew up 
that maybe didn't have that support in their life, move that to the forefront to over, not overcompensate, but to ensure that that support is to their children and to their wife at home uh, or their husband at home. Because, you know, I, I grew up, I didn't have that kind of relationship with, with my father. So I want to make sure that I had a very good relationship with my daughter and my son to the point that I put that to the forefront of over business, whether it was coaching or being at events, whatever it was, I wanted to make sure that that support was there. Do you find that to be normal amongst CEOs or, or business people that are successful? I do. I find that just like what you had said, because you didn't experience that necessarily in your life, you 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 want to overdo it because you're like that. I want my kids to have that. What I didn't have, you see that, but you also see people mirror their experience where they said nobody did it for me, and I'm not going to do it for uh, for my kids or my family either. So wow. you see the two. So okay. it's not you know you chose you chose the correct path and saying okay that's that's um you know. I think that's important and I want to do that. So you overdo it. And so, which is great. So if that, I see the two. Yeah. I never thought of the other side of the coin, the way you said, no one's did it for me, so I'm not going to do it for them time and time. Yeah, you see, you see that too. And it's probably, probably equal 50, 50. Wow. Never would have, never would have thought that um, by any means. So a uh, couple of uh, quick rounds of questions here for you here on, on, on business philosophies, if you may. So obviously um, financial advisor, what do you recommend first, real estate or investing in the market? Uh, my so my here's my philosophy on it because I I um I own I own real estate I own securities, and so I would say that um, initially somebody needs to start. It's hard. Somebody needs to start the, the philosophy and the process of saving and investing. So I would say. Start initially investing in some type of retirement account, IRA, 401k, or something like that. That's initially. And then once you kind of get the concept of paying yourself first, accumulating some assets, then move on, try to figure out how you can get your own home. How to navigate. How could you, how could you buy, your, you know, how could you not pay rent? How could you get yourself into your own home? And then after you get yourself into your uh, your own home, then you start thinking about second property, third property, fourth property, et cetera. Okay. Um, that's, that's kind of my philosophy on it. Love it. And what I just heard there is that real estate is a, is a good investment in your portfolio strategy. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, absolutely. I know Warren Buffett had said once that, oh, you know, he believe you know, if you could rent your home, you're better off doing that. And uh, I, why I really admire Warren Buffett. Uh, and I actually have been in Omaha and I've driven past this house in Omaha, Nebraska, and he's got, a, he has a really nice house, not a really, really nice house, but you know, he's got, he's got, he's got a nice house and he owns it. So, uh, I, I think everybody should, should do whatever they can to try to figure out how they can own their own home. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think his, uh, his business partner, Charlie Munger would probably say, try to own as many homes as you can. Yeah, exactly. Get all of them. Um, get all of them. For, for, for most Americans, it's without question, um, uh, probably, 90% of Americans opening your own home will be the biggest asset you'll ever have in your life. Yeah. No, I, I definitely saw that stat from Kiplinger as well. So what's your one more, that's the name of our show. What's your one more thing you're trying to do in life? Your one more, you know, uh, dream or, or one more moment that you want to have in life? You know, I think about this every day. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, uh, and I, and I, and I sit there and I, and I kind of like almost like meditate and I'm like, well, I know I'm limited to my time right mm -hmm. here on here on earth with everybody here, right? So so forth, we're all gonna pass on. And what what kind of legacy do I want to leave? Oh, love and that. My my you know, and I I still feel my family comes from Italy, my parents come from Italy, and I'm and I'm so I'm like, okay, I, I think I want to uh, you know, deepen my roots back there and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna i'm gonna try to do some cool stuff there that's fantastic you know i get asked this question all the time on the shows because it is our show and one more other people show the same thing you nailed it legacy that is exactly what i look to leave with this and what we're doing in life and and uh you know one of god's greatest gifts to me is is my children and my wife because my children are my wife and i's legacy uh, and then obviously meeting my wife was, was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. But the legacy portion is extremely, and, and, it, and legacy is defined in so many different ways. It doesn't have to be, you know, a, a money legacy as much as it is having your kids be, you know, uprised to something great to society that will give back in some manner to help improve those around them. That's the legacy that, that I'm hoping to strive to teach them and, and really kind of model them in towards doing. So I love the fact you said that word. 
the other thing you said there that was really interesting to me is you said, you know, we all have a certain amount of time, you know, on this earth. And I had a gentleman on the show, Patrick Young, um, who's a former NBA player, Gator basketball player, about eight months ago was in a car accident, paralyzed from the waist down. And he's sitting in a wheelchair in the studio and he said, Q, we all have an expiration date on this earth. So we need to live life full and die empty. And I thought, man, dude, to ha- I, I'm getting like the hair on my arm stand up when I say it. it was that powerful statement. It resonated with me when you said that. I was like, those two, those two things go hand in hand. So that's a great, great statement there. You know, Rocco, I, I, I'm very impressed with everything you've done. And the book that you wrote, I think is wonderful. Can you tell our audience more about how they can get details on that, where they can find it, where they can pick it up, websites, et cetera, how they can learn more about you? Sure. Yeah. So the book is called The Three Chords Approach to Life and Wealth Management for Business Owners. And they can get the book on Amazon through barnesandnobles.com. There's a lot of different places that uh, that sell it. And uh, if they wanted to learn more about what we do and how we do it, they can go to my website, which is roccoacareero.com. That's R-O-C-C-O-A-C-A-R-R-I-E-R-O.com. Well, I know if they could just Google you, they're going to find two, three pages yeah. worth of information about you all over online. You're, you're all over the place. So I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for being on the show today. It was an honor having you on here. Guys, if you liked what you heard, five-star review this podcast. Please share it with friends. Write a review. Check us out. Subscribe on YouTube and on our social channels at What's Your One More with the number one. That's What's Your One More with the number one. Rocco, again, thanks for being on the show today. It was great having an honor uh, honor having you on the show as a guest. It's an honor to be here today, Quentin. Thank Thank you so so much, much. my friend. I got one more shot. I'm going to make it. One more chance. I'm going to take it. And when I said it, now it's time for me to do it I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah